Sorry. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our webinar. This is Stephen Bliss with the California Budget and Policy Center. And we're happy to have you join us for our briefing on the governor's proposed 2018-2019 state budget. Um, members of our team will be speaking through um, our first look analysis of the governor's budget and talking about what it means for our state. And then of course, we're leaving plenty of time for your questions. Um, and just as a reminder, this event is part of our Policy Perspective Speaker Series, um, a series of events that uh, brings together expert analysis to talk about some of the key policy questions facing California. Um, I also want to remind you all that uh, you can follow the discussion and join the discussion on social media this morning. Uh, the hashtag is our policy perspectives, um, as is the case for all our series events, and also you can use the hashtag CA budget. Uh, for this uh, particular webinar and your comments. Um, you can also use social media to pose questions uh, to us. We'll be monitoring Twitter and we'll put any questions from you through to our uh, panelists. Um, and you'll also be able to submit questions via the questions pane, um, which is on your um, GoToWebinar dashboard. It's about halfway down. Just uh, type your question into there and we'll directed to the appropriate speaker on today's event. Um, just another couple quick housekeeping notes before we move into the presentation portion of the event. Um, in the handouts section of the uh, GoToWebinar dashboard, you'll see um, a PDF of the slides and also a PDF of the first look analysis that we released last week. Although I should also point out that we'll be sending out an email a few hours after today's webinar with links to a video recording as well as to the event slides. Uh, today's speakers uh, include a number of our staff, Chris Haney, Executive Director, Scott Graves, Director of Research, Essie Hutchful, our State Policy Fellow, Jonathan Kaplan, Senior Policy Analyst, and Senior Policy Analyst, Kristen Schumacher. As I said, we'll walk through sort of the top lines um, of the governor's proposed budget and some of the implications for our state and for the state budget. Uh, debate this year, and then dig a little bit deeper into some of the specific uh, sections of the budget. And so with that, um, please do introduce and turn things over to uh, Chris Haney, our Executive Director. Chris. Great. Thanks, Stephen, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, to talk about the governor's proposed budget, what we know so far, uh, what that budget contains, and what some of the details are in terms of new proposals that are included in what the governor has presented to us to date. I want to start by just talking for a few minutes about some big themes uh, that cut across the budget. And the first of those is just simply uh, the high degree of uncertainty that state leaders face as they prepare a budget uh, for 2018 and 19. Uh, a, a degree of uncertainty that uh, in many respects is unprecedented in recent years, uh, and is at the scale of what they faced when they were looking at the Great Recession in terms of the potential for federal budget cuts. Uh, one of the things to note is that the governor's budget has not had the time yet to assess what the full impacts might be of the Republican tax bill that was passed at the end of December. And so there's still the unknowns about the tax bill's effects on the state's revenues and spending. Uh, and then there are federal budget proposals coming down the road in the coming weeks that could also affect the state's budget. So that creates a lot of uncertainty, certainly economic uncertainty about the future plays in as well. The second major theme is about the about saving for a rainy day and uh, putting away dollars on a one-time basis. I'll come back to that issue. Um, and uh, uh, and then the action, the whether our new proposals, we'll walk through in a few details. But let's just talk about some of those um, those considerations. Uh, the one thing that the uh, the governor stresses is that, that uh, on the one hand, the state revenues are coming in at a good clip. That's because the economy has been growing. Uh, and that means that between the economy and the, the tax increases that were passed by voters in recent years, that state revenues are coming in well. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, but, it, but that's judged against uh, a state that has high costs of living, a large number of people living uh, in communities where it's difficult to make ends meet on lower incomes, high poverty rates, uh, the kinds of numbers and statistics that we've shared with you on many of occasion and that 
require some budget response uh, uh, on the state's part in order to help people make ends meet. Uh, and even despite eight or nine years now of pretty consistent economic growth, we have a number of key public services and supports that are still operating at levels lower than where they were prior to the Great Recession almost a decade ago. Uh, and then outside of that are these other big uh, near-term considerations about the potential risk of a economic downturn. The governor always stresses the length of time about which we've had economic growth in this state and about the how that can't go on forever. He's certainly right in that regard, but there are also some indi uh, indicators of some ongoing growth. I'll come back to that. The impact of federal tax legislation, which I've already mentioned, and coming federal budget cuts, which were previewed in budget proposals that the Trump administration and congressional leaders put out in 2017. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what's in the governor's budget in terms of top lines. On the revenue side, uh, the governor forecasts that there will be uh, $4.2 billion more over the three-year budget window than was projected at the end of the last budget cycle as we started this year's budget. Uh, if that three-year budget window, it's always important to remember that when in every state budget, we're always uh, basically assessing how we did in the prior fiscal year, adjusting for what that looks like, um, looking at the current fiscal year and where we are and assessing for those conditions and then projecting where we're going to be for the next fiscal year. So that three-year budget window uh, across that, we're talking about $4.2 billion higher in revenue. The governor, uh, both in part probably because this is his last year and because it's consistent with how he has budgeted, is stressing building up state reserves with those additional revenues, including a major discretionary optional deposit into the state's rainy day fund that I'll talk about here in a minute. The budget also fully funds the local control funding formula, the, the, the funding, funding formula for K through 12 schools and proposes a new allocation system for community colleges as well. Uh, and as I noted earlier, includes various types of one-time funding across the budget. And if you combine the one-time funding strategy with the rainy day fund, an optional uh, reserve deposit, uh, what you're looking at is a budget that's being very cautious about allocating those additional state revenues uh, to ongoing commitments in, in key public services and supports. And that's reflected in the fact that uh, uh, other than these top lines and the bullets above, uh, there are essentially not any new investments in many key services that help families make ends meet and advance economically. And those will, that'll certainly be an issue going forward in terms of if things that people and state leaders will be debating. So let's talk a little bit more about those economic outlook and projections that, that are in the governor's budget. Uh, while he uh, regularly stresses the um, potential for a economic recession at some point down the road, his budget in terms of revenue projections uh, notes that the proposed budget assumes that the California economy will grow over the next five years. Uh, but with jobs added more slowly than in the prior five-year period. So in other words, he's projecting that we will maintain a fairly gradual rate of growth for the state, but that that growth rate might look uh, less uh, dramatic um, than it has over the last couple of years. And this proposal mirrors what was in the legislative analyst office forecast uh, uh, that came out in November as well. Uh, what that means, as I noted earlier, in terms of the revenue forecast for the state is uh, that there's $4.2 billion more across the budget window. This is largely driven by higher projections for personal income tax collections and sales and use tax collections. Uh, when you kind of add all of this up and you look at the space that's available in the budget, the Department of Finance and the governor's projections look somewhat similar to the legislative analyst office projections from November. Both of them basically see about $7 billion in space. And by space, I mean uh, revenues that aren't necessarily allocated or accounted for yet that will be the source of policy debate as we go forward uh, over the next few months. And so let's talk a little bit about the governor's proposal in terms of what he would do with those revenues. And I'm gonna start by talking about this, uh, the largest proposal in some respects from a scale perspective is that the governor opts to take a good chunk of those uh, revenues that are coming in for 2018-19 and to maximize 
uh, the amount of funds that are in the state's rainy day fund. Uh, and to back up a little bit, uh, this is all under Proposition 2, which voters approved in 2014, which requires the state constitutionally to put aside 1.5% of the general fund each year and in years when capital gains are a larger percentage than normal of the state budget that the additional capital gains revenues also go into the rainy day fund. And for 2018-19, what that would mean is that the state is required to put away 1.5 billion um, under Proposition 2 into the state's rainy day fund. Uh, and that's in the governor's budget. But the governor is also proposing to make a supplemental one-time $3.5 billion transfer to the rainy day fund beyond what Proposition 2 requires. So it's essentially taking some of those additional revenues off the table, putting them into the rainy day fund on the grounds of saying that basically with a lot of uncertainty at the federal level and unknowns about the economy, the state should be maxing out the size of its rainy day fund. And that, that maximum in the constitution is set as 10% of general fund tax proceeds. And with the governor's supplemental transfer, he estimates that we would hit that 10% mark in 2018-19. So that's the biggest proposal in terms of where he would allocate some of those new revenues. We're gonna walk through some of the other proposals that are in the state budget. And we're gonna start with the early care and education world. And I'm gonna uh, sign off here for a second and we're gonna bring on Kristen Schumacher, my colleague, to talk about early care and education. Hi everyone, and thanks, Chris. As some of you may know, California's subsidized child care and development system includes a variety of subsidized child care programs and the California State Preschool Program as well. Funding for these programs was cut dramatically during and after the Great Recession, and despite the diligent advocacy of many different groups, overall funding for the entire system and the current state fiscal year is still more than 500 million below the pre-recession level after adjusting for inflation. The governor's 2018-19 proposal maintains a pattern of incremental reinvestment that we've seen over the past few state fiscal years. First, the January proposal adds nearly 3,000 full-day state preschool slots for local education agencies as the final installment of a multi-year plan that was included in the 16-17 budget. In addition, the budget proposal makes a temporary hold harmless provision related to voucher-based provider payment rates permanent. This hold harmless provision was part of the 1718 Budget Act, and as a result, certain providers wouldn't see a decrease in their payment rates on January 1, 2019, when the provision is set to expire. In addition to providers that accept vouchers from families, there are also providers that contract directly with the state, and these providers are reimbursed according to the standard reimbursement rate. The proposal provides a small increase of the standard reimbursement rate of just 2.8%, which is effective on July 1. And then finally, as Chris mentioned, the governor's proposal includes one-time funding for various programs across the budget. And this includes a new competitive early care and education grant program funded with about 167 million in one-time funds. The stated goal is to increase the availability of inclusive early education and care from kids from low-income families, and then also kids with exceptional needs. The administration hasn't released many details on this new proposal other than what was included in the budget summary. But I wanna reiterate that these are one-time funds and as a result, likely won't be used for ongoing expenditures such as slots. And then also 75% of these dollars or 125 million are Proposition 98 general fund and are restricted to use by local education agencies. So next up we have senior policy analyst, Jonathan Kaplan, who'll talk you through the various education proposals. Hello, everybody. So the big news in uh, K-14 education is that the Prop 98 guarantee uh, has increased, according to the governor's assumptions, by about $3.1 billion over the revised 2017-18 funding level. That's about a 4.1% increase in Prop 98 funding. And as a result, that allows the governor to increase ongoing funding for the local control funding formula by about by $2.9 billion in 2018-19, which allows the state to fully implement that formula in the 18-19 year. That's two years ahead of the original estimates when the formula was put into place. 
Um, this means that all school districts in the state are going to reach their target LCFF funding grants in 2018-19, according to the governor's budget. The governor also invests 200, more than $200 million in a new high school career technical education program that's funded through the existing a strong workforce program. That was a program created in the 2016-17 budget uh, that expanded career, uh, career and technical education and workforce development as it was administered, as it is administered by the California Community Colleges. The governor also provides $1.8 billion in one-time funding on a per pupil basis to retire state mandate obligations, that's debts that states the state owes to schools, and it also provides $100 million in one-time funding uh, to address the need for more special education teachers statewide. The big news in community college land is that the governor, as uh, Chris noted, is providing uh, for a new allocation model or proposing a new allocation model. He's using $175 million of Prop 98 funding, ongoing funding to, uh, for community college base grant uh, based on a per full-time equivalent student basis uh, that's similar to the current funding formula. That's about 50% of the overall funding that the governor is providing in this new allocation. Each community college district would also receive about 25% of that proposed funding in a new supplemental grant that's based on the number of low-income students that it enrolls, low-income students basing, based on the number of students that receive fee waivers or that receive Pell Grants. And then each community college district would receive about 25% of the proposed funding in a new student success incentive grant uh, that would be based on the number of students who complete uh, degrees in three years or less and the number of degrees a community college confers in a given year. The governor is also proposing in his budget a, uh, a $120 million amount to establish a new community college online, fully online community college. 100 million of that funding would be used to set up this new online college and $20 million would be used to operate the online college moving forward. The governor's proposal indicates that enrollment in existing community colleges would not be affected by this uh, proposal. However, it's unclear uh, how that would be the case. Uh, the proposed budget also provides $46 million for uh, implementing last year's community college, or I'm sorry, California College Promise, which allows community colleges to waive some or all of the $46 per unit fee that first time community uh, California residents uh, pay for community colleges. Finally, the governor's proposal includes modest increases for the University of California and the California State University. The proposed budget increases funding for those two segments by $92.1 million each, or roughly 3%. Uh, the governor notes that uh, the California State University is expected to use those funds to improve graduation rates for two-year transfer students and four-year graduation rates overall. And the governor also notes that receiving $50 million in 2017-18 funding at the University of California is contingent upon uh, implementing recommendations made by the state auditor last year. So with that, uh, I will now move to Scott, who's gonna talk about corrections and other issue areas. So good morning, thanks, Jonathan. So first, uh, I'm gonna talk about state corrections. The governor, in his proposed budget, continues to emphasize uh, the decline in the number of incarcerated adults at the state level. This is uh, primarily due to the fact that California legislators, uh, the governor, and voters have approved a number of very important criminal justice reforms in recent years, including Proposition 57, which the voters approved on the 2016 ballot. Um, Prop 57 made a number of changes. Um, one very important one uh, gives state officials uh, new authority to uh, award sentencing credits to uh, people in state prison in order to reduce the length of time um, that they spend in prison. So this was seen as a way uh, to help um, reduce um, overcrowding in the state prisons and help to meet a federal court order um, that requires uh, California to stay below a certain population threshold. So under Prop 57 and a number of other reforms, the governor is projecting that over the next several years, uh, the number of uh, prisoners at the state level will decline by several thousand, um, around 6,000 by 2022. Um, and this is important uh, not only because 
reducing incarceration is very critical in California, but also because it will allow California to end the use of out-of-state private prisons. Currently, uh, we house uh, over 4,000 people in private prisons in Arizona and Mississippi. Um, by reducing the number of, of uh, inmates overall in California, um, the governor anticipates that we'll be, we'll be able to end the use um, of those private out-of-state prisons uh, within the next couple of years. Um, in terms of overall state correction spending, spending does continue to creep up under the governor's proposal. It would be uh, reaching uh, around $12 billion uh, in the coming fiscal year. But it's important to note that that is um, a, a smaller amount, or that, that the growth rate actually of corrections uh, spending has been slowing in recent years, and also that it's been declining as a share of the state budget. So under the governor's proposal, state spending on corrections uh, would be just under 9% of total general fund spending. Um, that's substantially less uh, than the share uh, seven years ago um, when it was over 11% of general fund spending. Of course, uh, it's still important to keep in mind that we're spending a substantially larger share of our state revenues on corrections compared to a generation ago. Um, back in 1980-81, California was spending about 3% of its general fund on corrections. So in order to substantially and more rapidly reduce the size of the corrections footprint on the state budget, California would need to implement reforms that go well beyond those that we've been putting in place um, over the last few years. Um, but the governor's um, proposed spending plan um, does not include a plan uh, to further reduce this uh, state incarceration. Um, instead, sort of, uh, seeing the state's role in his last year as governor as essentially consolidating the reforms that have already been put in place and potentially leaving to the next governor the decision as to whether California is still spending um, too much uh, with respect to corrections. Um, I wanted to quickly turn to um, uh, healthcare spending in California and healthcare policies. As many of you are aware, um, there's great uncertainty uh, with respect to the Affordable Care Act and federal support for Medicaid or Medi-Cal in California, which provides healthcare services to over 13 million Californians uh, with low incomes. The governor emphasizes this uncertainty um, as part of his proposed budget. Uh, Congress made a number of attempts last year to repeal the Affordable Care Act to slash funding for Medicaid or Medi-Cal by tens of billions of dollars per year. Those efforts were not successful, but the ACA and Medicaid are not actually out of the woods yet. Um, because as part of the Republican-backed tax plan that President Trump signed into law last year, um, that included a repeal of the uh, individual tax penalty for those who don't opt in to health insurance. That's expected to have some disruptions on the individual health insurance market in California over the coming year. Um, President Trump has used his executive authority to undermine the Affordable Care Act. Um, and Congress is looking at the potentially making some significant reductions to federal spending for a number of services and supports that support low and middle income families, including Medicaid. So the state could be um, seeing some substantial cuts coming out of Washington, D.C., but because we don't know exactly what's going to happen, what the timeline is, whether any of this will actually be uh, put into place, uh, the governor's proposed budget assumes um, current federal law and spending, um, and that results in spending on Medi-Cal of just over $100 billion in the 2018-19 fiscal year, with about two-thirds of these funds, um, well over $60 billion, um, coming from the federal government. And I did want to point out there's, there's a bit of good news in those spending levels. Uh, many of you may know that California voters um, approved a state tobacco tax increase back in 2016, Proposition 56. And the largest share of these revenues do go to the Medi-Cal program and are required to be used uh, for provider rate increases. The governor allocates um, about $650 million of these new tobacco tax revenues um, in the upcoming fiscal year um, to provide supplemental payments to doctors and dentists um, who provide services through the Medicaid program or Medi-Cal in California. So that is clearly um, good news for those providers um, who are seeing, who will be seeing some increases um, funded with a new revenue source approved by the voters. So um, now I wanted to turn it over to my colleague, Essie Hutchful, who will discuss uh, children's healthcare services um, and other uh, key elements of the governor's proposal. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so in a, I just want to give a quick overview of the, the funding situation. So as 
many of you may know, since 2015, uh, the federal government has covered 88% of California's chip-related costs, and that's up from our historical level of, of 65%. So in this year's proposed budget and last year's as well, the governor assumes that we will have renewal of CHIP funding, but that it will come in at that 65% lower, lower rate. Uh, so reflecting the uncertainty of, uh, of in Congress, however, you know, we have to ask ourselves what happens if funding isn't actually renewed. Uh, well, in that, in that case, California would face higher costs to cover those CHIP kids who are enrolled in Medi-Cal, which is the majority of our, our CHIP population, we would be paying 50% of their costs. This proposed budget and administration officials, however, haven't actually confirmed what would happen for coverage for those 32,000 children and pregnant women who currently draw down CHIP funds, but aren't in that, who aren't enrolled in Medi-Cal, uh, and so the state doesn't have an obligation to continue coverage for them once federal funding runs out. So we're, we're really um, looking to see what happens in Congress uh, and uh, we'll have to, to keep our eye on that. And moving on to, to CalWORKs, as, uh, as you may have heard, the sort of big, big news there is a new home, home visiting uh, pilot initiative. Um, home visiting programs, uh, to recap for those who don't know, uh, they provide skills and resources to new and expecting parents uh, with the goal of uh, increasing you know, healthy child development uh, and family engagement. So this pilot program for CalWORKs families is going to allocate $158.5 million of TANF funds through 2021 the first 26.7 million of those funds are going to be in the first year. And as we understand the implementation date uh, for that program, uh, the target date is January of 2019. Uh, one thing we do want to note uh, and stress is that with all of this uh, exciting news, um, we want to note that the proposed budget still does not uh, fully restore the grant levels or time limits that have been cut to the program uh, in, in prior years. And then finally, I'm going to finish up with uh, a note on SSI and SSP. So we will see a federal increase to SSI um, of about 2.6%. That's going to be coming in 2019. But again, uh, on SSP, there's no state uh, reinvestment. And so levels are going to remain frozen uh, as they were in 16, uh, 17. And uh, with that, I'm going to throw it back to Chris. He's going to talk about what updates there are in this proposed budget for the previous uh, policies that have already been enacted. Great, thanks, Essie. Uh, so in a number of key areas, the governor's budget actually reflects some policy advances that were made in the state in recent years, in particular uh, um, in the housing and transportation worlds, uh, initiatives that were enacted by the governor and state leaders this past year. And so we're going to talk a little bit of just about those elements that are reflected in the budget, even though they aren't necessarily new proposals. So the first of those is the California Earned Income Tax Credit, which was enacted in 2015. Uh, the governor continues to fund the EITC as part of this year's bu budget package. Uh, those of you who followed its um, implementation will remember that the EITC, unlike a lot of other tax credits uh, in the state, actually is subject to an annual budget appropriation. And so the governor proposes to fund the EITC at the level that he's been funding at, which is 85% uh, of the federal EITC or an 85% adjustment factor, as you'll see it in the, the governor's budget documents. That would mean a cost of $340 million in revenues the state doesn't receive because this is a tax credit that goes to low-income working families um, uh, and, and therefore is, uh, amounts to foregone revenues. Uh, I should note that there are no additional dollars for uh, community-based um, outreach efforts to help sign people up for the EITC. Over the last couple of years, there's been a couple of million dollars put aside to help with those outreach efforts. So that's certainly one area that advocates will be pushing for to continue to help with outreach around signing people up for EITC. 
Uh, as I mentioned, the budget also includes proposals to implement the 2017 legislative housing package. So the governor and state legislators reached a major deal in this past year on a legislative housing package that puts in place a new real estate transfer fee. Uh, we'll put a housing bond on the, on the state ballot in June uh, and provides funding for uh, the production of affordable housing and homelessness programs. And so the 2018-19 budget reflects the first year of that package allocating $245 million from the real estate transaction fee for affordable housing and homelessness, $3 million to the Department of Housing and Community Development for changes in, that were included in that housing package, and then anticipating vo voter approval of a $4 billion housing bond, uh, the governor's budget allocates uh, 277 million in bond funds for multifamily housing. So uh, that, those elements are all included. They're not necessarily new proposals, but they're new in the state budget reflecting the deal that was struck this last year. Uh, somewhat similarly, the budget includes um, the first year of transportation funding that was part of a major transportation package that the governor and state legislators reached a deal on also in 2017. That deal is a 10-year, $55 billion transportation investment package. Um, the 10, the, the 2018-19 budget has the first uh, amount of those revenues come in, which are coming in from increases in the state gas taxes and increases in a set of other fuel taxes and vehicle-related fees. Uh, that amount is $4.6 billion in funding, and it's split evenly between state and local transportation projects. Uh, which is the overall allocation formula that was set in the package over the next 10 years. So both those housing and transportation packages are reflected for their for, for the first time in the governor's budget. Um, also want to note, because there's been a lot of attention to issues around immigration, particularly the, uh, the debate federally about the extension of the uh, DACA program, uh, the governor's budget maintains resources to address impact on federal actions on immigration. Uh, this, this is a, a main maintenance of uh, additional funding that was put in place in the current year 2017-18 budget, which is an, uh, $45 million for legal services related to helping with immigration status and supporting the Eternal Attorney General's office and their responses to federal actions. So those dollars are included once again in the 2018-19 budget proposal. So those are other key elements that are included in the budget. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about issues to watch for. It's important to remember that the governor's proposal reflects the opening salvo in the budget cycle. He gets the first bite of the apple, as my colleague Scott Grave likes to say. Uh, and we will spend the next few weeks and months uh, deliberating on the governor's proposal. State legislators will be offering their own variations through committee hearings and subcommittee hearings and advocate stakeholders and the public will be able to access and make their case for proposals they think need to be advanced. So we're obviously still early in the process and the governor will get his next bite at the apple in May when he presents his revised uh, budget, which will reflect updated revenue uh, projections and will also reflect anything new that we know about uh, what might be happening with federal proposals. So a few things that we'll be watching for uh, that we will help in terms of better assessing where the state is relative to federal issues will be that we'll have some early indication of what the impact of the newly enacted, enacted federal tax law is. Uh, as I noted earlier in the presentation, uh, the governor's office hasn't had time yet to, to be able to accurately assess uh, what the effects of the GOP tax bill will be. And so we'll know more over the coming months as people file their taxes and we can get an early assessment of what that means for California, what it means for its revenues, and then we'll provide state leaders with some uh, further information they can use in terms of assessing how they might respond. Uh, very similarly, we'll also know more about potential federal actions in terms of the federal budget, uh, both the federal, the potential extension or shutdown that's being debated this week back in Washington, DC, as well as uh, what we've been expecting to happen sometime soon, uh, a set of proposals from Republican leaders in Congress to make significant cuts to programs like Medicaid, Medicare, food assistance, or the SNAP program, or CalFresh as we call it here, and other key supports. And we know uh, the contours of what those proposals look like because 
the outline of those proposals was first put forward in the skinny Trump budget that was released last March and April, and then uh, were more formally introduced in a set of House and Senate budget resolutions that were part of what triggered the ability for the Republicans to pass their tax bill. And so we know that, for instance, there are proposals there to make a $1.3 trillion cut uh, to Medicaid over the next 10 years, uh, nearly $500 billion in cuts to Medicare, and some sizable cuts to food assistance and other supports. How far they get uh, in the coming months amid lots of other action and debate uh, in Congress and it being an election year is, remains to be seen, but we may know more by May um, as the state comes to the May revision about what the implications might be for state spending and for state revenue. Uh, and then that leads to what the legislature's response will be in the coming weeks and months. Uh, they'll certainly amid a state budget that has additional revenues and has an initial proposal from the governor to put a sizable chunk of those revenues into the rainy day fund, there will certainly be some push for greater investment levels than have been put forward so far in the governor's budget. Uh, and where those go, uh, the California EITC or CalWORKs or other programs, uh, those debates are only uh, just starting here in Sacramento uh, in the days uh, since the governor released his budget. Um, so uh, where there's a lot to watch for in the weeks and the months ahead. Uh, if you want to hear more about where we are um, as that goes on, we will be having a uh, annual policy conference that we do in Sacramento each year. This year it's March 22nd at the Sacramento Convention Center. It's called Policy Insights 2018. You can register now and we will be digging much deeper into some of the proposals that we have uh, outlined quickly here for you today. We'll know more about the legislature's response and advocates and stakeholders uh, proposals and those types of debates will be the kinds of things we'll be providing more information about as we get to Policy Insights 2018. So we'll stop there and open this up for questions. I'll turn it back over to Stephen who will moderate this part of the session and uh, steer you toward the best way to ask questions. Thanks Chris and thanks everybody. So um, we've had a number of questions come in already and uh, we'll get to those, as many of those as we can. We'll have the uh, appropriate individual on the panel uh, come online and, and answer it. We uh, currently, we're really pleased with the turnout today. We have more than 300 people um, who are actually joining us, so we'll get to as many questions as we can, but I want to encourage people to either tweet questions at us uh, at Cal Budget Center or using the policy perspectives uh, hashtag or the other and perhaps easier way to submit questions, uh, as noted earlier, is via the questions pane on the uh, GoToWebinar um, dashboard. And we've already had a, a few questions come in. And please, uh, please keep uh, those coming in. We have about 20 minutes available for questions. Um, just as a reminder, uh, as noted earlier, all the slides, uh, the entire slide deck for the presentation uh, today will be sent out to everybody who registered via an email later today. Uh, also, if you go to the there's a little handout section on the dashboard uh, in GoToWebinar, and you can actually go right there and download both the slide deck as well as the first look report that we put out last week on the heels of the governor's budget release. So keep those questions coming in. We'll get to as many as we can. And I want to start with one that came in about correction spending. And this has to do with whether the state will continue to use uh, private uh, in-state or, or contract prisons to house its incarcerated population. Scott? Hi, thanks, Stephen. Just checking, Stephen, that you can hear me? Yep, all good. Thanks, Scott. Okay, great. So, yeah, that's a great question. So, earlier in my presentation, I noted that the governor's administration assumes that with Prop 57 and other criminal justice reforms, California will be able to end the use of out-of-state uh, contract facilities, uh, so we would no longer be housing um, Californians convicted of various felonies um, outside of California. Um, that doesn't mean, though, that they would be placed in one of the state's 34 state-owned prisons. California currently has around 6,500 people who are housed in contract facilities within the state of California. Uh, our understanding is that uh, Prop 57 and other reforms would not reduce uh, the number of incarcerated adults enough for California to be able 
uh, to also end the use of in-state contract facilities, some of which are private, some of which are public. Um, and that is because the overall level of incarceration wouldn't be coming down um, enough to move people out of those contract facilities in California into uh, the state-owned prisons, the, the 34 state-owned prisons. So that's an important point to keep in mind. And I just want to re reiterate that for those of you who want to go beyond the reforms that have been made because you want to reduce the size of the corrections footprint on the state budget, um, that's going to require additional reforms um, that go well beyond what we've seen, um, the very important reforms that we've seen over the last several years. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, we had another question that came in, which has to do with one element of uh, pension spending, and this is, has to do with CalSTRS, the teacher's retirement system, and um, the current status of CalSTRS, and in particular, wh whether any changes to the allocation for CalSTRS affects the sort of available or you could say usable funds uh, for K-12 education in California. Jonathan? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Um, there, as uh, for those that are not aware of it, in 2014-15, uh, a compromise and agreement was reached with regard to CalSTRS, that's the state's uh, retirement system for teachers. Uh, a compromise was reached for funding that the long-term liability in CalSTRS starting in that year. Um, and as a result, the state took about two-thirds of the responsibility of the unfunded liability at that point in time and assigned a third of that responsibility to school districts and to teachers. Um, and so the, without going into the complexity of how that those percentages worked, um, basically in the 2018-19 budget year, the one coming up, according to most recent projections, the difference between 17-18 and 18-19 funding on the part of districts, that is how much districts are responsible for, it was roughly about an $800 million increase between 17-18 and 18-19. So uh, the, the, the thing to pay attention to here is that, that that amount that the districts are responsible for is amping up, that's increasing, has increased over the past few years and will continue to increase until the 2020-21 budget year. Uh, and then it will actually taper off and actually become constant moving forward, whereas the state's responsibility uh, is actually amping up and will continue to do so over the next 15 years. The other thing to pay attention to is that the state's portion of the CalSTRS liability is not a part of the Prop 98 guarantee. So the reason I mentioned districts uh, as, as uh, the, the key uh, piece here in terms of the increase between 17, 18, and 18, 19 is that their uh, portion of the funding for CalSTRS does come from Prop 98 funding. So I hope that helped to explain uh, the portion of quote unquote usable funds that are uh, uh, now allocated towards CalSTRS responsibilities. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, again, keep the questions coming in. Um, again, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, as a reminder, the, the webinar today is focused on our sort of first look, initial gloss on the governor's budget. Um, we will be doing a number of analyses in the coming weeks and months that look at specific uh, elements of the governor's budget in detail. Um, so if you have a question for us that's about a specific uh, line item in the budget or something very detailed, we may not be able to address it on this webinar, but we will get to as many uh, questions um, as we can. We have a question about the uh, proposed gas tax repeal. Uh, this has been, as many people know, discussed as a potential ballot measure uh, for November, although the latest reporting is that they're facing some challenges and getting the signatures to put it on the ballot, but there, there does seem to be a good choice, a good chance, I should say, that uh, California voters will be asked to, uh, to consider repealing the gas tax, which was a, a core, but not the only revenue piece in the governor's transportation package that was enacted last year and that Chris touched on briefly. So the question just goes to, um, the the prospects of, of gas tax repeal, but just to basically talk about kind of the, uh, you know, how the gas tax fits into the package, but also just the latest on the prospects of gas tax repeal in our state. Great. Thanks for that question. And it's certainly going to be a big issue uh, for the funding of the transportation package that I outlined in brief earlier. Uh, so uh, what I know on the 
ballot measure side of things is is what's been in the news of late, uh, which is that there are two different efforts to put a repeal of the gas tax on the state ballot. The first of those led by GOP uh, governor candidate Travis Allen uh, seems to have uh, missed the deadline for signatures and therefore it doesn't look like it will be going forward. But there is another effort uh, that um, has a longer period of time uh, deadline wise. And um, so there still may there still may be another um, uh, chance that the repeal of the gas tax proposal appears on the ballot. Uh, that. That is a, a huge share of that $55 uh, billion dollar transportation funding package that I was outlining earlier. It's certainly uh, something that the governor and state legislators who back that package will be pushing to protect uh, and maintain going forward. And one of the things to stress about that is, in many respects, the increase in the gas tax uh, was a correction for the fact that the state has not increased the gas tax in over two decades. And the governor has. Uh, a well put together chart in his uh, executive summary to the budget showing that essentially the increase in the gas tax that pays helps pay for the transportation package basically takes the uh, gas tax the state uh, puts on gas and other motor fuels uh, and raises it to the level it would have been at had we been adjusting the gas tax for inflation uh, year in year out and very similarly going forward, the gas tax as it's now structured in the transportation package would index that gas tax in, uh, for inflation in the years ahead so that we don't have to make these mid-course corrections uh, um, uh, uh, decades at a time. So um, that'll be a big issue going forward. It'll certainly be a big issue on the ballot and the governor in his press conference uh, signaled his uh, support for maintaining the gas tax and will certainly be a major voice in uh, trying to protect it as we uh, move toward November. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we have a question that I think you know both uh, SA and Scott could probably speak to, sort of a follow up on on the issue of uh, funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program or CHIP. Um, SE briefly noted earlier kind of where things stood and sort of some of the uncertainty on the federal front. And this question goes to sort of the current status of the chip deliberations, but also sort of what California's options might be going forward, um, particularly if, if the feds are unable to come to some sort of agreement around around funding for chip, which uh, given that federal funding plays such a critical role in how that, uh, how that fits together. Uh, sure, can, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, perfect, thanks, Jesse. Great. Um, so, again, the proposed budget uh, didn't really have a lot of detail on what um, the state would do uh, in the event that uh, funding, federal funding, didn't come through. Um, so, this is sort of also reflecting both the proposed budget and uh, uh, what administration officials uh, have said, which is that regarding the you know the thirty-two thousand kids. Uh, and, and pregnant women uh, who, for whom the state doesn't have you know, a, a formal obligation uh, to provide coverage, um, is that they're sort of waiting and seeing what's going to happen at the at the federal level, um, and they're not really uh, making any definitive remarks uh, about about the status of, of uh, that population just yet. Um, in terms of what our options are, again, if funding, federal funding didn't come through, uh, for those CHIP kids who are enrolled in Medi-Cal, uh, California has to uh, maintain coverage for them. Uh, we would face higher costs to do so. We would be paying 50% of the cost instead of 12% as we're doing now. And then for the uh, the other pool uh, of people, that would be a, a, a policy decision for us uh, to make on whether or not we would continue to cover them or or, or not. Scott, do you have anything else you wanna you wanna add? Hi, uh, you know that was a great explanation. I think this is an example of one of those um, issues uh, in state budget and policy making that really is about the money. Um, it's a wise investment for California to provide health coverage to children. It's nice if the federal government provides funding for us to do so in large part or even half the cost. 
Um, but if it really came down to it, essentially, uh, if the feds decided to pull the rug out from under California, it would simply be a question of California deciding to make this um, a priority um, and to set aside the dollars that would be needed uh, in order to ensure um, that this very important coverage uh, for children and pregnant women continues to be provided. Some things are just about the money. This really is about the money. Yeah. Thank you both uh, for that thorough uh, response on CHIP. Um, we had a couple, a number of questions come in about kind of ballot measures um, for this year. And I just want to kind of put out to the group uh, a general question about, you know, each year or uh, most years there's a number of key ballot measures either already qualified or proposed or in the works with uh, budgetary uh, impacts or related impacts. I just want, so, so the question kind of goes to anything that we're looking for uh, in terms of potential measures uh, on the statewide ballot this coming November. Hi everyone. Well, I think there's still a lot of question marks out there about what will appear on the ballot, but there are there are certainly two notable uh, sets of potential ballot measures that are still collecting signatures or have signaled that they will be attempting to go forward that would affect the the, the property tax system in the state of California under Proposition 13. Uh, on one side, you have a set of progressive advocates who would like to see reform to the commercial property tax system, bringing uh, commercial properties up to market levels for the sake of uh, property taxation. Uh, and so the, that effort has proposed a ballot measure to make those reforms and has signaled that they will be trying to get that placed on the November ballot. On the other side of things, the uh, California Association of Realtors is uh, has a set of measures, one of which will, they will be seeking to push forward that would take the uh, current um, restrictions on residential property taxes that uh, restrict people's uh, property tax bills from increasing until they sell their homes or the property changes hands in some way and make some of the, that tax bill uh, portable for those folks if they were to move uh, or for seniors if they were to move. And what the structure of that proposal looks like in its final form um, uh, still has to take shape. But there are gonna be some, at least right now, it looks to be that there will be some significant uh, measures going forward that would affect the state's local property tax system. Uh, there has also been a proposal put forward so far here again, the, uh, these things have to collect enough signatures to go forward. So there's certainly still a lot in the mix, but there's a proposal that would reinstate an estate tax in the state of California and use those funds for higher education purposes. Um, and there are, I'm sure, are a variety of other uh, efforts in gestation out there. I think there's a lot of folks who are still waiting to see whether they go forward pending um, what we know or don't know about federal actions in the weeks ahead. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Chris. Um, the Another question we had come in and we have uh, just a few minutes remaining. We wanna to try to end right, uh, right at 11 o'clock um, or a little bit before to keep to the hour. Um, just a couple quick uh, housekeeping reminders uh, is that, as noted earlier, the slides are already available to you via the handouts pane, and we'll also be sending them out via email later today and posting them on our website. Um, this question goes to the group um, in terms of anything, uh, and Chris touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, but sort of anything that uh, we're hearing as to uh, proposals that the legislature might be looking to uh, implement um, particularly uh, or might be looking to, to advance this year particularly in areas where we're seeing uh, investments still below where it was uh, prior to the recession or um, places where, where, where the legislature seems prepared to be ready to push for for more state funding particularly in light of the uh, the high rates of poverty that we have in our state so that's kind of a general one for the group if anyone wants to jump in with anything that uh, that we've seen either either in the assembly budget blueprint or otherwise that go beyond some of the things that have been uh, touched on touched on earlier on the webinar.
Hi again, everyone. So uh, I do. I think that we it's still early. So what the what we will see in terms of proposals from state legislators um, is we, we don't have the a lot of detail there yet, but that we will soon. You will certainly see state legislators putting forward proposals that would uh, make investments in uh, programs like CalWORKs, SSI, SSP, uh, some of the programs and services that are operating at levels that are still below where they were prior to the Great Recession. Uh, the, the clearest uh, contours of a plan that we've seen so far have come from the Assembly uh, Budget Committee led by Phil Ting, or I'm sorry, from the Assembly Democrats on the budget side, uh, led by Phil Ting, the Budget Committee Chair in the Assembly. Uh, and that has, for instance, a significant expansion of the state's EITC as a major provision. Uh, so I think you're gonna see you know, a lot of different proposals, all walks of proposals to try to say, look, there's more room in the state budget uh, for some further investments. Uh, so far, state legislators, state leadership have been signaling that they are supportive of uh, building up rainy day funds and they will also want to be fiscally cautious, uh, but they do believe there is some additional room for investment uh, as they work with the governor in the months ahead. Thank you, Chris. So we're just about up to um, 11 o'clock. I did want to make a couple notes in closing uh, about the questions. Um, and again, thanks for the various questions that came in. Um, as I said earlier, given that uh, we've, we're still kind of digging into the details of the governor's proposed budget, um, we haven't been able to look at all the various uh, line items in detail and some of the questions that have come in uh, that we didn't get to uh, just to emphasize, we actually, in doing our analyses going forward, uh, look at the questions that we got on the webinar, in particular the ones that we perhaps didn't get to, um, haven't, haven't had a chance to analyze yet, and that actually helps inform our analyses going forward because it gives us a lens into what people are interested in hearing about. So if we didn't get to your question uh, today, uh, apologies for that, but like I said, we will try to address a number of these uh, in blog posts or other reports. Uh, throughout the throughout the course of the budget cycle. So with that in mind, um, just as a reminder, we will be uh, continuing to do webinars and various types of online uh, presentations uh, that address the uh, the state budget in this year's budget debate. And uh, you know, to make sure that you get that, go to our website and sign up for uh, email updates, which is right on our homepage. Um, we also will can will be doing a similar webinar uh, as part of. Uh, in looking at the May revise in a few months, and then of course talking about the uh, governor's enacted budget, uh, or I should say the enacted budget in June. So um, any questions that you have or any any topics you want to see us cover uh, in future events, feel free to shoot us an email at contact at calbudgetcenter.org. And again, we'll be sending out the slides via an email later today. So um, thanks to the uh, more than 300 people that attended uh, today's webinar, and uh, we look forward to continue to provide you with updates and analysis as we move through this year's budget season. Uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us, and have a great day.